Hello, I'm Katrina with the Palm Beach County Library System, and this is a novel idea. In this program, we share with you the first chapter of a work of fiction to give you a preview of the story, voice, and style of a book that's currently available to borrow from one or more of our digital collections. It's kind of like watching the pilot episode of a new TV show. If you can't wait to find out what happens next, you can check it out with your library card by following the links below. Don't have a card yet? Sign up for a free, temporary e-card that will give you access to all of the library's online resources by clicking the registration link. The Starless Sea is the long-awaited sophomore novel by best-selling author of The Night Circus, Erin Morgenstern, published by Doubleday Books. This literary fantasy about libraries and books and pirates and painters takes readers on a beautifully imagined magical journey that will appeal to those who enjoyed The Ten Thousand Doors of January by Alex E. Harrow, The Age of Witches by Louisa Morgan, and Once Upon a River by Diane Setterfield. This book is available now as an e-book and an e-audiobook from the Cloud Library Digital Collection. And now, The Starless Sea. Book One, Sweet Sorrows. Once very long ago. There is a pirate in the basement. The pirate is a metaphor, but also still a person. The basement could rightly be considered a dungeon. The pirate was placed here for numerous acts of a piratey nature, considered criminal enough for punishment by those non-pirates who decide such things. Someone said to throw away the key, but the key rests on a tarnished ring on a hook that hangs on the wall nearby. Close enough to see from behind the bars, freedom kept in sight but out of reach, left as a reminder to the prisoner. No one remembers that now on the key side of the bars, the careful psychological design forgotten, distilled into habit and convenience. The pirate realizes this, but withholds comment. The guard sits in a chair by the door and reads crime serials on faded paper, wishing he were an idealized, fictional version of himself, wondering if the difference between pirates and thieves is a matter of boats and hats. After a time, he is replaced by another guard. The pirate cannot discern the precise schedule, as the basement dungeon has no clocks to mark the time, and the sound of the waves on the shore beyond the stone walls muffles the morning chimes, the evening merriment. This guard is shorter and does not read. He wishes to be no one but himself. He lacks the imagination to conjure alter egos, even the imagination to empathize with the man behind the bars, the only other soul in the room beyond the mice. He pays elaborate amounts of attention to his shoes when he is not asleep. He is usually asleep. Approximately three hours after the short guard replaces the reading guard, a girl comes. The girl brings a plate of bread and a bowl of water and sets them outside the pirate's cell with hands shaking so badly that half the water spills. Then she turns and scampers up the stairs. The second night, the pirate guesses it's night, the pirate stands as close to the bars as he can and stares, and the girl drops the bread nearly out of reach and spills the bowl of water almost entirely. The third night, the pirate stays in the shadows of the back corner and manages to keep most of his water. The fourth night, a different girl comes. This girl does not wake the guard. Her feet fall more softly on the stones, and any sound they make is stolen away by the waves or by the mice. This girl stares into the shadows at the barely visible pirate, gives a little disappointed sigh, and places the bread and the bowl by the bars. Then she waits. The pirate remains in the shadows. After several minutes of silence, punctuated by the guard's snoring, the girl turns away and leaves. When the pirate retrieves his meal, he finds the water has been mixed with wine. The next night, the fifth night, if it is night at all, the pirate waits by the bars for the girl to descend on her silent feet. 
Her steps halt only briefly when she sees him. The pirate stares, and the girl stares back. He holds out a hand for his bowl and his bread, but the girl places them on the ground instead, her eyes never leaving his, not allowing so much as the hem of her gown to drift into his reach. Bold, yet coy. She gives him a hint of a bow as she returns to her feet, a gentle nod of her head, a movement that reminds him of the beginning of the dance. Even a pirate can recognize the beginning of a dance. The next night, the pirate stays back from the bars, a polite distance that could be closed in a single step, and the girl comes a breath closer. Another night, and the dance continues, a step closer, a step back, a movement to the side. The next night, he holds out his hand again to accept what she offers, and this time she responds, and his fingers brush against the back of her hand. The girl begins to linger, staying longer each night, though if the guard stirs to the point of waking, she departs without a backward glance. She brings two bowls of wine, and they drink together in companionable silence. The guard has stopped snoring, his sleep deep and restful. The pirate suspects the girl has something to do with that. Bold and coy and clever. Some nights she brings more than bread. Oranges and plums secreted in the pockets of her gown. Pieces of candied ginger wrapped in paper laced with stories. Some nights she stays until moments before the changing of the guards. The daytime guard has begun leaving his crime cereals within reach of the cell's walls, ostensibly by accident. The shorter guard paces tonight. He clears his throat as though he might say something, but says nothing. He settles himself in his chair and falls into an anxious sleep. The pirate waits for the girl. She arrives empty-handed. Tonight is the last night, the night before the gallows. The gallows are also a metaphor, albeit an obvious one. The pirate knows that there will not be another night, will not be another changing of the guard after the next one. The girl knows the exact number of hours. They do not speak of it. They have never spoken. The pirate twists a lock of the girl's hair between his fingers. The girl leans into the bars, her cheek resting on cold iron, as close as she can be while she remains a world away. Close enough to kiss. Tell me a story, she says. The pirate obliges her.